Right, morning all. Um, so the next session is the panel on leveraging meeting content, moderated by Heather Staines, who's on the way. Um, with respect to that, we now have more than 30 people already joined us remotely and online, which is terrific. So as you heard from, from Alice and Mark, please get in the chat. Let's get this moving. Let's get the discussion going. And whether you're online or in the room, and you want to ask a question, then ideally put it in the chat so that we can curate them for Heather. But obviously, there's the option to put your hand up. And if you want to ask it anonymously, it's just a question you'd like to put to the panel. That's fine, too. But stick them in the chat, and I'll make sure that Heather gets them. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to Heather. Hello? Sorry, it wasn't on before. Hello, we're so excited um, to be here today um, to have this session about uh, video content uh, from conferences like this. I'm juggling lots of things here, so forgive me. Um, we have three wonderful speakers today, um, and they're going to introduce themselves. Uh, but just so you know uh, who is who up here before we start, we've got Peter Berkeley uh, all the way to my right, the executive director of the Association of University Presses. Uh, then we have uh, Emma Voden, director of publications for Bone and Joint Publishing. And uh, immediately to my right, Simon Inger, the chief revenue officer for Cadmore Media. Uh, I, I always forget to introduce myself and I get in trouble when I go back. I'm Heather Staines, I'm a senior strategy consultant for Delta Think and the director of community engagement for the open access data and analytics tool. Uh, and in the interest of full disclosure, I am on the advisory board for researcher to reader, so I am completely biased uh, in saying that this is the best conference you could possibly spend your time in uh, attending. So uh, just to kick us off today, I'm going to start with um, Simon, and I would just like uh, each speaker to sort of um, just give us a flavor of the perspective that they're going to bring to the conversation today, just briefly, and then we'll go right into questions. Um, and as Mark said, we'd love to take questions from online and also questions uh, from in the room. So do uh, keep keep us in mind for that. Simon? OK. Thank you, Heather. Is that nuts? Yes, good. Um, hi, yes, I'm Simon Inger. I'm uh, one of the co-founders, as well as the chief revenue officer of Cadmore Media Limited. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've spent just over 35 years in the scholarly publishing arena, um, and, and Cadmore is the most recent of, of the ventures that I've been involved with uh, over that time. Um, Cadmore is a company that's been founded to help societies, as I like to say, do interesting things with their audio and video content. So we help societies and publishers to actually publish their video, probably with the same care uh, that they publish anything else, with DOIs, workflow tools, uh, and so on. Um, there's many areas that obviously involve video, uh, but one of the interesting opportunities for video comes from events uh, and the output of content from events. Um, and it's been very interesting, I think, over the years to, to, to watch the development uh, of, of what happens to event content. Is in the past, um, much event content, whether it was filmed or not, was it was simply thrown away. Um, but I, I, I often call to publishing types to actually take control of that content and do something interesting with it after the event. Um, otherwise, it, a lot of it go, goes into the bin. Um, I'd just like to say also by further introduction that um, a lot of people, we, we talk about event content and monetizing ev event content in video format as if it's a new thing. Um, what happened with the pandemic is it enabled more people, suddenly many, many societies had their content in video, whereas in previous years they'd not been videoing it at all. But there are societies that have been doing this for a long time, so SPIE, for example, has a long-standing um, video archive as part of its, uh, a, a, its digital offering. Um, 
and, uh, and, and others as well are tied in often the video talk at a conference um, with uh, proceedings journals in, in particular. So although we're going to be talking about, I think, a lot of the opportunity that comes from, has come from hybrid events because that's given a lot of societies a lot of content in video, I just wanted to let, say that it's not just new. Um, this has been going on for some time. Thank you. Emma? So I'm Emma Vodden and I'm the director of publishing at Bone & Joint and we are a small independent orthopaedic specialist publisher and we've been very traditional for the last 75 years. Um, we are quite an un underfunded specialty so open access is a huge challenge for us as a small independent um, and we've been looking around at you know what it is we could do to um, shore up the future for the society and the pandemic um, presented us with an interesting opportunity. Um, we saw all these conferences happening within orthopaedics and that output was perhaps going on to maybe an association or society website in a very flat format, often maybe a, you know, as a two hour session block and often then perhaps being lost the next year when they, everyone's focusing on the next conference. Um, so we've partnered with, with Cadmore and we're aggregating that content. And because we are you know, very specialist, we've got lots of relationships with societies and associations. And we've been able to, to leverage those relationships to take that content from these conferences. We're breaking it down into individual talks. We're putting transcripts on it, loads of metadata. We're giving them DOIs. So we're, we're publishing those, those, um, those talks. And we've, we've seen fantastic success with this globally. Um, and we're just expanding into surgical techniques and other educational videos because this is a really valuable resource and this is something that we're then, the plan is once the usage is up to, to, to monetize it. So that's kind of my perspective. Okay, thank you. Peter. Hi, yeah, I'm Peter Berger. I've been the executive director of the Association University Presses for the past decade. Prior to that, I was the uh, publisher in the US Law Division at Oxford University Press. Um, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about our association first. We have 160 members in 16 countries. Uh, membership is institutional, not individual. Uh, and we've had about 20% uh, membership growth in the past decade. Uh, it's, uh, membership eligibility is criteria-based. Uh, our annual budget is around 1.6 million. The surplus from our annual meeting is the second most important source of income after dues. Uh, while we've managed to maintain and even expand programming during the pandemic, uh, that surplus uh, has become unstable. Um, we have seven professional staff. A quick inventory of our current meeting content. Uh, we do an annual meeting where we have two to three plenaries that are usually recorded and 36 concurrent sessions, six of which are recorded. In addition, we do about 35 webinars a year and only about a third of them uh, get captured currently. Uh, how the pandemic has changed our approach to meeting planning. Uh, COVID taught us all the benefits of virtual, more attendees from distant locations, more attendees by early career staff, more attendees by staff at underfunded institutions. Um, and occasionally when they don't have to travel, you can score a better speaker. Uh, but we do understand the value of in-person. So in October of 2021, uh, our board took the decision, uh, hybrid scared us. Uh, largely because of cost, but because of some other reasons as well. Um, uh, so actually, I'm hoping I can learn something from this experience here today and tomorrow. Uh, so we took the decision in October of 2021 to alternate between uh, virtual and in-person meetings. We were in person last year uh, in Washington, D.C. We'll be virtual this year. Next year, we're in Montreal. You get the idea. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the background and the the, what will inform uh, the perspective I'll be bringing to the conversation today. Thank you, and I'll say when I started talking with Peter about the session, uh, he was like, I'm, I'd be there to learn. Um, we're still very much at sort of the beginning stages of having these discussions about ways that content can be monetized. Um, and I was happy to hear um, I, you say that you guys were kind of just starting on this, this foray recently, because I think a lot of folks in the room who are not from some of the bigger societies or the SPIEs who have been capturing it for a long time are probably in that similar spot, and, and hopefully we can give some, some takeaways uh, to go back uh, from, uh, from the discussion today. Um, 
So I'm just wondering, you know, Simon, when you're talking to different uh, players, um, and I'd, I know we have other organizations in the room uh, who manage uh, conference content platforms, and I'd love to hear from you guys in the questions and comments as well. When you're talking to different companies, um, you know, what are some of the things that they should keep in mind before they get, try to get started in the space, technical or otherwise? Oh, wow. Well, um, Just a softball. It's, it's a small one, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, by starting the space, we're talking about taking the content from an event and, and publishing it uh, in an online uh, database of some sort. Well, obviously, the first thing you've got to be thinking about is what, what's the business model? Um, who am I ultimately going to be selling this to? What is the benefit? Um, there are a lot of angles uh, to look at here. Um, there, are, there are some subjects where um, content, aggregated content output from uh, perhaps a series of events will make a, a very fine library product, especially in different regions of the world. Um, there are people that are uh, looking at, uh, that license their content out to aggregators in the space as, as well, to, you know, such as un Underline. Um, in the medical arena, then there's definitely people who are able to attach uh, CME models uh, to that as well, um, and, and professional development qualifications from, from watching the stuff. Um, the other major opportunity, I think, is, is looking at the, the global angle. Um, I've always been conscious, um, as, when I was working as a consultant, working with societies, that um, I've always had this little thing that publications is more global than membership, which in turn is more global than events, generally speaking. Um, and what can you, I always ask the question, what can you do with that event content to become just as global as the publications were? And in many ways, the answer to that is publishing it um, and, and moving it out to those same markets. Because there's a very large number of people in the world that can't get to events like this, but would f deeply benefit from it. And there's an online experience, absolutely. But then there's a whole load of accessibility issues, um, uh, which can also be addressed in an on-demand post-event format. So, um, and certainly for those for whom English is a second language or third language, um, having the, the content there uh, in front of you to consume on demand at leisure is actually going to be an easy way. So I'm sorry, I've probably gone way off it, but that's my starting point is actually thinking about where, who's going to benefit from this. I should probably just cut into one other thing is that the content capture needs to be as inexpensive as possible to make it sustain a sustainable um, uh, uh, project. And one of the things that I like the most, and I know this is going to vary from society to society, organization to organization as to what's achievable here, but I like very much what the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics have successfully done, which is to say, if you're coming to speak at our conference, you still need to pre-record your talk at home before you turn up so that we already have that content in the can for the online on-demand version. And that obviously is way cheaper than videoing it on site, especially when you're getting to the kind of conference with 5,000 speakers in it, which is typically what they have. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as you get to actually do the presentation live to the live audience, uh, I think that's the, the twist. Um, none of us wants to record something and just be recording into the void <laughs> um, as an alternative. Um, Peter, so the university presses that are members of AU Presses span almost every conceivable discipline. Um, I feel like as a, as a historian myself, we might in the humanities and the social sciences be less familiar with having content captured um, at events and, and maybe might be a little bit hesitant to put what we see as early works out there. Uh, do you, have you found that in conversations with members? Well, it's funny, in the uh, trivia quiz, uh, which, which archive was fictitious? I said, oh, it has to be the historians. Historians have no interest in preprints. <laughs> so, 
I can tell who the HSS people are out there. They're laughing. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, like a lot of the, the current issues we're all wrestling with, like open access, you know, these things came to STEM first and then poured it over. Uh, so I think uh, a, a lot of university presses um, are still wondering what, what and how uh, uh, to get uh, uh, involved in video, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was pretty obvious to me that it was probably a uh, hist archive, but we got distracted because we hadn't heard of one of the others and we jumped on media archive. Um, so Emma, uh, what sorts of considerations did you guys face when you were thinking, you mentioned the, the, the pandemic, uh, and the impact um, perhaps on uh, you know, kind of business as usual, but um, certainly you probably had CME before you decided to move into this YouTube for orthopedics, as, as you called it in the planning session. You know, what were your considerations and, and, and how did those internal conversations go before launch? Um, I think, um, it's a hard question to answer. I think some of our biggest challenges were actually approaching the associations to get their content, because like you've just mentioned, a lot of people don't necessarily want to have their content available forever. And so some of those conversations about, you know, we want to archive your content, we're going to provide it kind of, we're providing the service for free to them. Um, there were lots of um, objections to um, some of the research communities not necessarily wanting it up there. But actually, one of the biggest um, societies that didn't want to have their content on is now actually our biggest supporter. Because as exactly as Simon said, we've created com we're completing the loop between our proceedings content, so the flat abstracts, linking back to the videos. And central to everything we do is kind of what value can we provide to our community? What, what value is it to the user? And we've, we've tried to create a product that was highly searchable, very discoverable, and user-friendly, which you know, all of the transcripts provide that um, on the videos. So I think some of the challenges were how we could actually make that content useful. Can I just ask the, your biggest supporter now, they were originally reluctant, what was the source of the reluctance? It was around putting their content out and not necessarily wanting it out in the arena quite so broadly. So they're happy to talk at their conference um, in, a, in a live event um, to the community that they knew that was closed. But obviously our platform is kind of open to everyone. So they didn't necessarily see that as a benefit. Um, but just talking them through actually has, has kind of ended that. Yeah, I mean, that's an, an interesting point in itself. It's the content when out in the wild. It's, and the fact that it does seem to make people uncomfortable that um, you could speak within these four walls and that's fine. And, and somehow that it's a, still a secret that I've said it. Um, and that, that, that people around the world won't find out what I've said here. Um, uh, and somehow being recorded makes it different. Um, I, I, I find that fascinating and half the audience tweeting about it anyway and photographing the slides is not a lot, it's not really that it's secret, but it's, it's a genuine worry um, for some that they're being recorded and it's being played back in, in, in the future. Um, Having said that, there is also the flip side to that. Um, for, from an author perspective, a speaker's pers perspective, they're going to get a much larger audience. And I, by, by having it uh, videoed and available on demand afterwards, um, which presumably is a, is a better outcome, especially career-wise, if you've said something clever. Um, and I remember, um, I think it was the very first conference, major conference that got cancelled is the American Physical Society um, in March of 2020 um, and an awful lot of the physicists were already out in I think it was Denver or somewhere um, and uh, afterwards they said well the conference has evaporated um, but a lot of the, 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 the speakers went rogue and they recorded their talk that they were going to give and posted it on YouTube or posted it on various websites and interestingly, afterwards, the APS came back and uh, rescued the situation, as I recall, and, and managed to bring that content back together in one place. But one of the most fascinating comments I saw at that time was from a, 
an early career physicist who said, my talk was due to be given in one of 70 parallels or whatever, and I was, I was going to have an audience of about 20. Since I posted this, my talk online, I've had 200 people watch my video. So isn't this a better thing anyway for me? So I think that's a really interesting angle, especially for early career people. Yeah, I mean, thinking about early careers, um, I, uh, prior to Delta Think, I was at a place called MIT Knowledge Futures Group, and we worked with Africa Archive, and one of the things that they did at the very start of the pandemic was they started to record what they called video preprints, um, and they couldn't get into their lab, um, and they just wanted to give a little sna short snapshot of their work, and most of the preprint servers at that time could not host video. Um, so uh, that their videos were, were hosted on, on PubPub, and I thought that was a, it, we were very excited to be able to bring that capability. Um, Emma mentioned findability and discoverability. So uh, metadata, as most of you know, is one of uh, my uh, key interests. What types of metadata needs to be created around this video content to make it discoverable and accessible? And I want to maybe start um, with, with Simon, I know VLN Iglesias was part of the NISO video uh, metadata group, but then I want to um, talk next to Emma about how that played out internally at Bone & Joint. Okay, um, yes, indeed. So um, NISO has actually just published um, its a report on guidelines for metadata in, in video. And I think one of the, the main um, realizations quite early on in that process, uh, which is now probably three or four years ago, was that video is not a content type, it's a format. The content type is still, a, is it a journal article? Is it supplementary data? Is it whatever? It's not, it's a video and therefore it needs this metadata. So the answer to the question is it needs the metadata that is appropriate to its application. So if it is indeed a journal article in video, it needs all the same metadata that a journal article needs and if it, on the other hand, is uh, part of meeting proceedings, it needs this, that, that level of metadata too. And actually, if it's a, a film, if it's a Netflix video, it needs a certain uh, different set of metadata as well that is appropriate for its application. Mm -hmm. and, and Emma, was that part of the discussions you guys had? Uh, yeah, we wanted to um, consider all of the ways that we could slice and dice the content. So um, orthopedics is very anatomically driven, so you'd have a, you know, you have a hip surgeon, you've got a knee surgeon. So obviously that was logical metadata that we were adding. But we've also added, you know, all of the speaker details, the institution details, um, obviously the meeting details, um, and any other sort of peripheral information that we could gather about the speakers, so maybe they're institutional um, home pages, their Twitter handles, lots of different um, types of material. And obviously we have a DOI for every video, so they can then link that back to their ORCID IDs, etc. cetera. Um, so, so now when you go to our site, you can see it through, you know, you could, look at, you could look at all the hip videos, or you could see everything that University of Liverpool have produced that's on there, or you could see um, Simon Inger's profile and how many videos he'd done, and that would collate for whatever conferences he'd spoken at where we had content. So it's, it's kind of um, filling lots of different buckets of content. Great, and I've got uh, another question for Peter, but I do want to remind um, folks online and in the room that we want to bring you into the discussion. Um, I know I've read through the attendee list that there are folks in the room uh, who have a lot of um, experience uh, with this, this topic. Um, Peter, it's, it's early days for AU Presses, but this interesting in-person alternating with the virtual meeting, do you find it, um, it's, it's the, the plan, I mean, obviously the planning for those types of meetings are quite different, but are you thinking about the content captured differently now that you're trying to take that duality into consideration? Um, I think we are, yeah. It's like you said, it is early days. Um, for us, the uh, 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 cost is going to be always the, the foremost consideration. Um, and um, I mentioned uh, in my introductory remarks that we have 36 concurrent sessions at our annual meeting, but we only record six. And that's mm -hmm. simply a function of how many cameras we can afford to put in how many breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the, the bar uh, is in an entirely different place. 
uh, in the virtual context. And so as we're, we're ramping up for this year's annual meeting in June, we are actually talking about what can we capture in advance. Uh, um, we expect, obviously, to record every session and to make every session available online. For us, the challenge is more um, uh, how, you know, uh, how do we monetize this content, A, to our members, I mean, how many times can you ask them to pay, and then B, uh, to the rest of the community of interest, and then the challenge there is finding that community of interest, right? It's um, uh, findability, searching the kind of mm -hmm. content that we produce, I think is a little less organized than it is probably for some of the, uh, uh, the, the med science and med medicine disciplines. Mm -hmm. Do we have anyone in the room who wants to? Um, Tasha, can you go to the microphone in the center? Please uh, introduce yourself, because uh, while I believe that everyone knows you, there may be one person here somewhere who doesn't. Sure, everyone knows me. Hi, I am Tasha Mellins Cohen. I am the director at Counter and also a consultant focusing on OA. And my question was you've referred to these as published outputs, as in formally published materials. What's the long-term preservation strategy for video? I mean, um, absolutely should be exactly the same long-term preservation strategy as whatever content uh, it is. I mean, so we've, uh, I've been, we've basically been talking to Clocks and Portico over the years and waiting for that first client that wants to go down that route, but there's no reason to be dealing with archival any other way. If it's worth publishing, it's that part of the publishing process is preservation. And so you need to make adequate um, preparation for that. I know that uh, when I was working on digital preservation for Springer, one of the big challenges was keeping the supplementary information connected to the primary <laughs> publication and that's often where it would be preserved but tracking it back and connecting it would be would be a big challenge uh do we have other questions here in the room or online mark anything online yep jake i know there's a lot of people in this room that have been thinking about this so we'd love to hear from you Hi, Tasha and I must be in question corner over here, right next to each other. Uh, Jake Zarnagar with Silver Chair. Uh, my question for the panel was, especially Simon, the way you uh, presented this as um, uh, like publishing new content. My question is, how are the panelists or others integrating this content to the current publica research publications and especially the web traffic and attention flows that have already been established? Are you creating new products on the side, or are you integrating this content into established products and established uh, web traffic? You start. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, both. Um, <laughs> so, um, for I, I think I mentioned so AIAA, for example, um, there's um, their journals are on Atapon, on 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 Literatum. Uh, the, and the, the proceedings journals are there, and so they tie in the talks given at conference with the relevant proceedings article on Atapon. There's a one-to-one -one relationship that can be embedded there, so 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 that exists. On the other hand, you, you know, if it, if it doesn't tie in with an, an app, uh, a single journal article, then. There's a couple of things. Either it could be a completely separate database for sale. Maybe it's a database of, that's considered a best practice. That there's, there's, Emma's got elements of that in, in her database that she was talking about. Or what others are doing is saying, here's the published article, and here were three talks over the last year that led to this as well. So you could doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one relationship. There's a lot of talks given at conference talking about progress towards a research output. So you could link multiple videos to the ultimate paper that was published as well, potentially. So there are lots of models, and the great thing about this space is it's very early doors, um, and uh, people are experimenting with all of these different things right now. Yeah, Emma? I mean, I've literally got nothing to add because it's literally both. You know, some of the stuff is standalone in the pro in the product, and some of it is linking back to our journal content, and we've you know made sure we can complete that loop. So, yeah. 
Peter? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very much early days for university presses, but um, one thought that occurs to me, a model that is emerging, especially in digital humanities projects, where the, the scholarship is born digital, is um, and uh, Brown University, for example, the library there has taken, really taken a leadership position on this. They will publish the digital humanist scholarship and then partner with the university press for sort of the, um, uh, the companion book, um, the companion monograph. Uh, but what's interesting is the, uh, uh, the online content uh, under Brown's model is available open access, but the print book, of course, you have to pay for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they've won a lot of awards up there at Brown. Every time we turn around, Allison's winning an award. Yeah, yeah. Um, kudos to them. Uh, we have a question from online, um, which is a little bit about you know workflow, uh, which is incredibly important. Um, permissions uh, as a topic. Who is responsible for getting permissions to share that content uh, from workshops and, and conferences? And I think workshop permissions may be a little bit different than conference permissions. Um, and it probably uh, varies, but to, when you're working on the content capture, is it the organizers? Whose responsibility is it? Everybody hates to do it, right? <laughs> so we've had to um, deal with this quite a lot because when we started the product, most of the conferences we were capturing on, in the database had already been recorded. Um, so the conference organizers had to go and get retrospective permission to host it on our platform as well. Now with the conferences prospectively, um, it's just a, another part of the speaker release form. Mm -hmm. so. We, tr we try to get our, um, uh, the functional equivalent of the workshop organizers to, to do the lifting, but ultimately it, it falls back to the conference organizer if they're not able to corral the permissions. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just want to add to that, I mean, it's not directly on permissions, but one of the big problems that we see with societies in particular is they're very siloed. So you have the events people and you have the publishing people and you have a separate bunch of people on membership. And the way I characterize it is often the publisher, the, sorry, the, the events people are of the mindset of, phew, the event's over, I can stop now. And the publishing people are saying, you've generated a whole load of content, this is where the work begins, let's move with it. So you're, you're absolutely right that the permissions tends to be with the events people, but half the time the events people are just not interested in publishing it. Um, it's the publishing people within the society who are. So the, the, the publishers within the societies do need to go and wrestle some control back uh, or get some control over that lovely created content. Um, I'd like to invite Laura Harvey to the microphone uh, to ask a question, and I will say that um, I had a little nice intro planned about how it was so meta to be talking about um, capturing hybrid content con conference output at a hybrid conference. And uh, Laura beat me to it on, uh, on, on LinkedIn uh, with, with her promotion of the session. So thank you, Laura. Uh, please ask your question. Sorry about that, Heather. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Laura Harvey from Exordo. And my question was, um, what does quality control look like for uh, organizers looking to make video content kind of perpetually available or available online on demand? Do you, uh, I was going to say there's two elements to quality. There's the quality of the content <laughs> and then the quality of the video. Um, I think in terms of uh, the content, of course, that's just down to the, is the, the same as anything. It's the, is the, the event organizer, um, the normal process. Um, and, uh, but for, from the actual um, preparation of the video, I think, it, interestingly, uh, one, one thing the pandemic did bring is it made everybody a video expert at home. Um, we literally were putting events online um, pre-pandemic um, in, in on-demand format, and part of the cost of working with organizations was working with their speakers to, to teach them how to record themselves on Zoom or even how to start Zoom up. And then within six months, everybody in the world became a Zoom expert and is perfectly capable of, of self-recording. So that took away an enormous barrier right there. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the responsibility for quality in all aspects left, right, rests with the, with the publisher, of course the one who's going to put it out there. 
think also there's a generational thing, like the TikTok generation, they're not necessarily, the younger generation not necessarily looking for that polished content. Um, you know, lots of surgeons are watching YouTube videos just before they go in to do the operation. It's, you know, it's for real it's scary. <laughs> and so I think, <laughs> I think there's literally, yeah, yeah I think there's a, a generational thing coming through where you, it's about what the, what the person's saying, not necessarily about the quality of the capture, as long as you can understand it. Gosh, I'm going to ask ChatGPT to create me a fake video, uh, surgery video now. <sighs> Please don't. Um, we have an online question that I'd love to learn more about, if the online questioner would be willing uh, to, to uh, ask the question, or to tell us a little bit more. I will, I will go ahead and ask the question, but as we're answering, if our online questioner, whose name is not listed, would actually like to tell us a little bit more about this. I would, I would love to hear about it. So the question is, a lot of history conferences have done video content of specific panels for public service. Um, are other disciplines doing this kind of selected strategic service approach? Um, you know, as a historian, I, again, I'd love to learn more, so if you would be willing to come online and tell us a bit, but I will um, pose that to our panel. Peter. This is just a wag, because um, it, 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 it's what came to mind first. Uh, um, the American Historical Association has been doing a lot of kind of the online public service videos in response to the specific moment we're in, you know, where uh, a certain political force, can I just speak frankly? You know, where, where, Sure, it's where, just us chickens. Where the extreme right is distorting the historical record for its own political purposes. Um, one, one, um, one video on the AHA site in particular, uh, a school teacher uh, in Montgomery County, Maryland, in the US, uh, was interviewed talking about, uh, she, she actually was a, um, uh, she, she was a child during, uh, uh, during Second World War in Nazi Germany. And I think some school board in the state of Tennessee had just banned the book Mouse, maybe. And so, so uh, she, she got on and was interviewed uh, talking about uh, the importance of, of memory and of not trying to whitewash, the his, whitewash history or to make, to, to, to make certain people feel less responsible or to feel better about themselves or whatever's going on out there. Um, and it was just a very, um, uh, it, was, it was an eloquent, frankly, and really moving uh, uh, five-minute public service video where this woman was explaining how growing up in uh, Nazi Ger in, in Germany post-World War II, uh, uh, how important it was for them to be direct and, and reckon with their past. Anyone else? Yeah, I won't mind if that's all right. Uh, the, uh, just not to do with history, but the, just a, a society that I know that does this is the British Ecological Society. Um, they run their event um, and it has an expert side but also the same speakers or a number of the same speakers come back and have a layperson's day or weekend on the end of the conference which I know translates very well into online so that's used for general outreach um, to the world. Mm -hmm. We have a follow-up uh, to Laura Harvey's question um, for our speakers. Um, a couple of benefits from actually doing a sort of enhanced published conference session in comparison to just slapping up a YouTube video with captioning. Um, what, what are the value differentiators that make it worth going that extra mile? Well, I think we all had that earlier, didn't we? When we all laughed or looked horrified at the thought of the, the surgeon just checking up how to finish off an operation on YouTube because it might not be the best content. And so curation is everything, isn't it? I would hope they're actually looking at a product for surgeons, but <laughs> now, now Emma looks horrified. Emma, enlighten us. I think it depends what you're after, but if you're having your content curated by an organization like us, you're also having it promoted by an organization like us. The association of being part of a bigger thing, I think, is probably useful. Plus, YouTube's not specific to your community. It's for everybody. Whereas, if you're partnering with someone like us, we are actually 
producing content very specifically for one community. So everything we're doing around that content is tagging it with you know, the, the right terminology, the taxonomy is, is absolutely relevant. So the person looking for your content is more likely to find it. Um, I think that's probably where I'd... I mean, br brand is everything, surely. I mean, if, if one day I need a replacement hip, um, I want to go to a surgeon who's been genning up on orthomedia <laughs> from the British Society um, of, of, of Bone and Joint Surgery um, rather than somebody who's been genning up on YouTube. You just would, wouldn't you? I'd like to invite Paul Killeran to the mic. <laughs> Hi everybody, uh, my name is Paul Killoran. I'm the founder and CEO of Exordo. Um, I'm not a publisher, I'm not a content person, so I'm probably the antichrist in the room with respect, but I, I come with a differing view and a question really. Um, that, and, and Simon actually hit the nail on the head earlier on when he said, after the event, the events people are delighted it's over, and then the publishing people are like, how are we going to monetize this content? And therein lies the flaw. Because you've got two sets of people thinking very differently about the same thing. Um, and the two sets of people need to come together and think the same. The question that I had was that by, by focusing purely on content for events, we're, we're in some ways we're missing the point. Because societies exist because they are communities. Without those communities, they cease to be exist. You need your community to thrive. And what's wonderful about scholarly societies is they're technical in nature. And every idea and thought that they have is expressed as content, which the people in this room ultimately monetize or tag or, or have metadata for. And what I'm saying is the future of societies is developing and building and growing those communities. And the way to do that is rather than thinking of this event happens, it's over, let's monetize data, is actually we need this community to thrive producing content on a continuous flow rather than this stop-start concept. It's continuous. It's a continuous conversation. And um, I, so the question I think I, I'm asking you is, um, I'm trying to frame this in, in a politically correct way, but um, how, how, do we, how do we use content to drive community? That's the question. How do we use content to drive community? Uh, Emma, you want to start? Because I think this gets to the generational aspect that you mentioned, that uh, with, with younger members, they may have quite different community expectations. That's a good question. Um, I think one of the challenges for the younger generation is, you know, they'll go to a conference and they'll perhaps be the one giving the talk, but it's not their name on the program. So they don't get any kind of recognition. After a conference is, is done and their, their conference material is hosted on our site, it, their name is the one on that talk. And I think it's, it's about promoting the content in a way that people can access it and then stimulate that debate around it. I mean, everything we do is for our community. We're, we're a charity, so that's, it's not about profit for us. Obviously, we're not for loss either, but it's about trying to create something that's gonna make people wanna come back to you to be the source. So, you know, our journals are as high, content, high quality as they can possibly be. And, it's, and, and we're trying to bring people into our community um, from a younger age so that they, they, they feel part of something and the video is just one element of that and, it, and I think a society in general has to look across all different content types to, to bring in people. Yeah, and Simon, this gets back to your very first point about who, who, with, who the audiences are, who, the, who this is for. Um, <clears throat> yes, indeed, and there's, there's, there's so much there and the whole community aspect is, is enormous and, and rather like Paul, I think, you know, I, I, I believe in more 365 engagement. Um, one of the things we're doing with a couple of our clients now is, is building exactly that and uh, uh, concentrating less on an annual event and, concentr and uh, spreading that content out over frequent webinars with um, proper feedback and, and engagement as they go. And, but it also very much depends um, on, on the society and its needs, and, and, and every one is different. Um, so I'm just going to give you one example that always fascinates me. 
Um, I won't name them for reasons that become obvious because some people will think this is a, a bad attitude. But they're very happy that their co international conference has 500 people coming to it, even though there are probably 10,000 who would like to, because they like the fact that their in-person event is elite. Um, and they don't want others who have not made it to go to their elite in-person conference. What they want is also an online conference to serve the 10,000 people that don't get to come to the elite conference. Um, and engage that way with them. So they've got two different communities that they keep quite separately by running an annual in-person event and, and, and another annual online event for a different group. And I think the, the, the point I want to make from that is that wholly online events are legitimately are, are a different product. The in-person event is one product, online is another product. and. And you can actually completely market it that way and approach it that way if it's appropriate for your audience. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to be perhaps, well, elite and local, if that's what you wish, with one conference and be global and inclusive with the other. Yeah, and I want to, Peter, I want to give you a chance to respond, but we do have a question in the room from Simon Holt. And um, Simon, if you'd like to make your way to the microphone. Um, and while Peter answers briefly, and we'll sneak Simon's question in as the last question. Yeah, so I think the question, how does content drive community, is profound, and I'm confident I'm not going to give you a profound answer here. But um, I, it's, I feel like it's something that, that I, in particular, should actually ponder a bit, uh, because community is one of the hallmarks uh, of folks who, who uh, participate in our activities. And what occurs to me is we have an online communication and collaboration platform. We call it UP Commons. It's an instance of Humanities Commons, if you're familiar with that. So to me, your question really is how do we, that right now our video content lives siloed. Mm -hmm. So for me, the question is how do we integrate the video content into the collaboration tools that we already have rather than treating it as something separate and distinct. Okay, we've got three minutes, so uh, Simon, quick question. Sure, thanks very much. Simon Holt from Elsevier. Um, one of the benefits, I think, about conferences, events like this and other types of conferences is a synchronistic exchange of ideas. Over time, ideas are exchanged, ideas evolve, and some ideas become discredited or just become out of date. How do the panelists feel that we can mitigate the risks of conference participants, whether that's in workshops or giving conference talks, becoming discredited um, through having given opinions that are maybe have moved on or have become discredited 10 or 20 years ago if their conference talks are permanently available, recorded, out there, um, for everybody to see. So I'm thinking, for example, of people who maybe were OA skeptics in the early 2000s. That's a big question for just a few moments we have left. I'm going to say maybe one response and then we'll wrap. Uh, you can fight for it. Peter? I, I mean, the only thing that occurs to me is right, all of this video content is date stamped, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think probably as, as, as uh, uh, professionals and as human beings, we need to learn how to judge online content a little bit better in a lot of ways, including by looking at the, t the date stamp on it. Isn't it just like a journal article that was published 30 years ago and they've proved that it was, that it was wrong, just, you know, discredited in the same way? You have to kind of put, take things in reference to where it was, yeah. And, and I'm just gonna also naughtily add, doesn't the entire youth share their entire existence online uh, for in perpetuity? That makes me feel cringy, though. Um, so right before we wrap, I just want to, uh, Paul, you mentioned the not being a publisher. And Mark would probably throw me out if I did not point out that this is not a publisher conference. This is researcher to reader. Oh, I got the thumbs up. So um, with that, I would like to thank our panelists for kicking us off today. Um, and thank you for your thoughtful questions, uh, both here in the room and online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, Simon, Emma, and Heather. Fantastic job. Uh, if you could put the workshop slides up now, that would be good.
and there they are. Um, okay, so you're going to go from here to your workshop, um, ably and brilliantly organised by Phil and Jane. I'm sure you know which one you're supposed to be going to, um, but just in case you don't, um, there are the locations. And if you're online, um, you can see this in the, in the programme. Um, just follow the link on the agenda to workshop and then to your online virtual room for whichever workshop you're in like that and join the, the right space and if you're physical you have to use a map so uh, have fun and head for your workshops